Hello. Welcome to the Judge Ben Show. This is one in a series of shows which deal with legal topics. Uh, today we're going to talk about the proposed legalization of commercial sales of recreational marijuana in Vermont. This is a big topic and it's full of complications. We're just going to try to present to you some things that should be considered. The people you're going to hear from today are all opposed to this proposal because they believe it will lead to an increased use of marijuana and will have many very bad con consequences. In the prior three years, that is 2016, 17, and 18, a total of about 51 people were killed on the highways in Vermont by people driving under the influence of marijuana. This year, there have been 10 reported fatalities caused by consumption of marijuana by drivers operating on our roads. Uh, there is always kind of a delay in reporting, so I suspect we'll be close to the 17 average by the end of 2019. I'm certain, I'm convinced because of the experience in other states that if there is commercial sales of, of marijuana in the state, there'll be increased use of marijuana. Therefore, there'll be more drivers operating under the influence and there'll be more people who are killed. I think this is indisputable, although as we've seen recently in the news, there's no facts which can't be disputed, I'm sorry to say. In any event, uh, with me today is uh, Catherine Antley who's a physician working in Vermont, um, Ed Baker, who's a social worker and addition treatment specialist, okay. and Judy Margulies. 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 Uh, well, close, <laughs> close enough. Close. Yeah, close <laughs> enough. You could, uh, well, anyhow, who's a pharmacist from, yes. from Massachusetts. Correct. I think, it's, uh, I think it's very important that we get some input from other places. We're going to do another interview later today with uh, B Bishop James from New Jersey is going to talk about the New Jersey experience. Yeah. What I want to be clear on is that there's, there's just a lot going on here and it's complicated. And I want you to feel free to try to contact me as I go between the cameras uh, following the little red light. Um, <laughs> I, w I want you to be clear that you can contact me at Box 34 in North Hero, Vermont. Send me a note if you have questions or some other proposals you might have and I'll try to provide you with that information. Yeah. Honestly, I found after talking to my four guests who are going to be here today, <clears throat> we could have taken a whole afternoon. <laughs> but I'm going to try to keep this first segment within about a half an hour so we won't take up all of your time. I appreciate your looking at this because I think it's so important to everybody in the state. Um, I'm going to call on Dr. Antley. Catherine, if you would uh, say what you want to say. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> So um, I think that it's important when we talk about commercialization of marijuana um, <clears throat> that we're intellectually honest. Um, <clears throat> if we don't know the facts and we don't follow the facts, we make bad policy decisions. We've seen in the news um, people who are whistleblowers are important. Truth telling is important. Um, and unfortunately, based on statements and quotes that I have read in the media, there are those in positions of power and authority in Vermont today who appear to believe that marijuana commercialization will further goals of consumer protection and public health. <laughs> this is a fictional narrative being perpetrated and propagated uh, by the industry of addiction which has an unfortunate history of exploitation and deception in America. The unfortunate truth is that when we commercialize an addictive substance, uh, we end up with more public health damage and more, uh, uh, we are unable to control um, consumer, we are not, we have not been able to c control consumer protection uh, in the marijuana industry um, to date. In terms of public health, the Vermont Medical Society has come out against the legalization, commercialization and legalization of marijuana, especially the commercialization of marijuana, because this unleashes a uh, strong um, commercial force to increase addiction. And they do that primarily by two mechanisms. One is targeting our children who are more susceptible to addiction and creating a more powerful and dangerous substance which is more highly addictive. They put this then, um, it's attractive to children, they put this in, in candies, THC gummy bears, and we end up increasing 
the number of people who suffer from addiction in Vermont. This is an important concept. There are many, or there are some in Vermont who are furthering the myth that there's a set number of people in our society who suffer from this disease. This is not true. We change the environment and we can increase the number of, the, of people who are suffering. This is the tragedy. So what are we seeing in commercial states, commercialized states? We are seeing cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. This was previously a case report. So it, it was so rare, it was, it, it, we never saw it. Now we're seeing it in Colorado every single day in some, in some, ER, in some ER rooms, um, departments. And what that means is millions of dollars are being spent, which otherwise were being saved. This is a drain on our health care um, dollars. What else are we seeing? The highest childhood poisoning rates in the United States are in commercialized states. So the fact of the matter is, the unfortunate truth is that we're not able to control this. We have not figured out how to control commercial marijuana yet. We're also seeing increased suicid um, suicidality. We're also seeing um, teen um, psychosis rates, which are increasing. Um, and, and now, of course, we have the new vaping diseases, uh, which are uh, so tragic and have led to uh, teen deaths. Now, we're, we're, um, we know that 86 percent of the disease and deaths associated uh, with the vaping is associated with THC, and that these are um, not only street bought, they're also bought from shops. Um, so what are we seeing? We're also, in commercialized states, we're seeing uh, marijuana that has pesticides, heavy metals, and mold. In Oregon, only 3% of the state-sanctioned shops are actually tested. So if this is, there are those in Vermont who are putting it forward that we want to model Vermont's uh, system on Oregon. Oregon has a terrible record of, of, of controlling what they're selling. Um, in uh, uh, the state sanctioned st uh, shops also have heavy metals and the Massachusetts uh, Health Department has been unfortunately unattentive to some of these complaints. Um, we're also seeing the illicit market which these things are linked. Um, the illicit market is 72% now in California, they're saying, and uh, Governor Newsom has asked for the National Guard to come help the, fight the black market in commercialized states. So are we increasing our war on drugs by commercializing this, this, uh, this substance? Um, and also, um, we're getting reports that the illicit market is actually booming in Oregon, another state, the, the state that, that leaders in Vermont are looking to, to um, model our system after. So, I, I've um, concluded. Thank you. I hope we will not commercialize marijuana, that we will put child safety, public safety, and consumer protection first. I hope that people in the legislature hear you. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. Ed? Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Judge, and thank you, Catherine, for your, <clears throat> you know, obviously well-prepared and, um, you know, insightful comments. <clears throat> These are trying times for Vermonters <clears throat> for very important reasons. One of the reasons, the reason we're focusing on today, simply put, is drug use. If we focus upon the effects of psychoactive drugs to our society, we are immediately overwhelmed with the enormity of the present tragedy. In 2017, we lost over 72,000 Americans to drug overdose. In 2018, that number was slightly lower because we've taken some action to restrict and control access to opioid medication in our communities, <clears throat> illicitly used medications in our community. These numbers do not include deaths due to alcohol and nicotine. Both legal, commercially sold, both regulated, and both, I hasten to add, two of the leading preventable uh, causes of death on earth. Make no mistake about it. When we look at psychoactive chemical use, we are in the midst of a maelstrom. <clears throat> Shaken as a society, weakened profoundly by the effects 
of this public health disaster. Weakened profoundly by the effects of psychoactive chemicals on the human brain, causing addiction in a significant percentage of the population who use them. This is no fault of their own. Addiction is not a choice. Addiction is not a moral failure. Addiction is not a criminal personality. Addiction is a disease. It's innocent. Addiction is a disease that's fed into by clear genetic and environmental risk factors. We ask ourselves, how did this happen? Along with an already existing black market opioid trade in the 90s, we accepted concocted research, misguided advocacy, unregulated and unscrupulous marketing campaigns by criminal entrepreneurs within the pharmaceutical industry and the co-opted medical community's misguided attempts to create a pain-free population, all with the end result of what we see today. I ask you, how is it that with the information we presently have, with drug overdose deaths wreaking havoc in every county in Vermont, We are moving closer and closer to unleashing yet another dangerous chemical, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, into our social environment. We call it friendly names like marijuana. It's not friendly, it's not safe, it's a dangerous psychoactive chemical. This is a quote from NADAC, the National Association of Addiction Professionals, from their position paper. Although state and local governments are increasingly legalizing recreational and medicinal cannabis use, NADAC, the Association for Addiction Professionals, does not currently support the use of cannabis as medicine or for recreational purposes. Until the body of accepted research allows the scientific community to reach an evidence-based consensus on the effects of cannabis on the human brain and body, NADAC is unable to support legislative or voter ballot initiatives to legalize cannabis for medical or recreational use. This is from the largest organization of treatment professionals dealing with substance use disorder on a daily basis every day. I'd like to take one more second, please, to read from the Vermont Opioid Coordination Council's recommendations for 2019. Under their section on opioids and marijuana, they state, quote, consistent with its January 2018 report, the OCC continues to counsel a cautious approach to legalization of marijuana, given the lack of data on the health risks of marijuana. The council notes in particular, A, compelling evidence that cannabis use may increase the risk of developing non-medical prescription opioid use and opioid use disorder. That's citation number eight in the report if you want to delve a little bit deeper into the research. They also state as reasons for caution, B, Vermont data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health showing the decreasing and already low percentage of youth and adults who believe regular marijuana use is harmful. So less and less people, less and less people in Vermont today are beginning to see marijuana, perceive marijuana use as less harmful. We know that when the risk of, the perception of risk goes down, use goes up. Therefore, cannabis use disorder goes up. And they they cite finally C as reason for caution. The risk of sending a mixed message to Vermont's youth regarding drug use. I'll close now. How is it that we are about to ignore these recommendations from our own committee 
convened, convened of, of experts in our state. The fact of the matter is that THC is not safe. This is scientific fact. It's unequivocal. The fact of the matter is that THC causes mild, moderate, and severe cannabis use disorder in both adolescents, who are most at risk because of brain development, but also in adults. This is scientific fact, unequivocal. By allowing the commercial sale of THC in Vermont, we are undoubtedly increasing environmental risk for addiction for our child and adult populations. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Judith, it's Thank your you. turn, kid. <laughs> I'm up. You are. Um, and I'm so happy to be here, actually. It's, it's Vermont's such I'm a... I'm very grateful new... that you've come in from Massachusetts. It's really important that you give us some insight as to what you're seeing in your state. Yeah. And, and I'm happy to share that. Mm -hmm. uh, because as a pharmacologist uh, and someone who really studies drugs and understands the good parts of them and the bad things that can happen with drugs, I mean, it's, it's, this is a, always a double-edged sword. Um, well, actually, I should say it's something really positive with drugs, uh, but it, um, but I wanted to share something as a pharmacologist and also as a resident of Massachusetts, uh, the, some of the observations that I've observed in, in Massachusetts, and I have uh, actually a few slides that I think I'll be sharing with you. Uh, so as some of you know, uh, Wakefield, in Wakefield, Mass is the home of nationally known Curleaf, as, as they call themselves a vertically integrated cannabis company. They aim to do it all, to grow, to process, and to shell, sell marijuana products, capturing profits at each, at each step of the way. And then I have this slide here that's actually from uh, a Russian language news service, the News RU. As you can probably tell, it's been translated from Russian. They, they call cur the curl leaf investment from, Russia, from Russian b money billionaires shocking. They reported this money is coming from a former general of the Moscow News Service, NTV, and a former head of the la third largest Russian oil company. Uh, then the Oregonian, uh, in July of this year, reported that these two former Russian businessmen who hold U.S. citizenship, yet one lives here in the United States, in Massachusetts is where his defined home is, and the other still living in Moscow hold a majority ownership in Curlief the Massachusetts Curleaf Company, with 59% of the stock. Mm -hmm. um, then they, they are self-proclaimed. You can read the headline. Massachusetts-based Curleaf intends to dominate, dominate the entire United States ma marijuana market. With the July 2019 announcement this year of the acquisition of a multi-state cannabis company, Grassroots, the headlines read of the creation of the world's largest cannabis company, expanding Curleaf's presence in July of this year from 12 to 19 states. <clears throat> they believe that they are dominating in those 19 states. So here is that map that actually was on their website. This is <clears throat> Curleaf's website. Creates largest coast-to-coast -coast operation. Wow. Here is the map. Um, they control over 131, this was mid-year, 131 retail locations with a 19 statewide population influence over 177 million people. And in the last few months, it hasn't stopped here because we know that this expansion has got grown bigger just since mid-year. Uh, I know that Oregon is part of this, and I know that there are other, some other states, and I'm not sure if it was t Tennessee, Kentucky, mm -hmm. but there are other states that they are gaining this majority influence over with their, with their um, philosophy of being vertically in integrated. Mm -hmm. So on the same map, I would bring your attention. Vermont is right there in that light blue-green. Mm -hmm. um, so of interest to Vermonters, um, you might... Uh, uh, be interested that uh, Curleaf descri describes Vermont as being vertically integrated under their system, with Curleaf the largest license holder currently as of July of this year in the state of Vermont. Wow. Mm. This is their representation. 
Uh, vertically integrated, what does that mean? It means that they have control over a large number, possibly the majority of grow facilities, processing facilities, and sale of Vermont medical marijuana. Why is this important for their business model? Because it's believed that those individuals who control the medical will easily be able to convert if it's approved, which yeah. I tell you, I'm not for. But if, you, if, they, if they control the medical in a state, they are, can easily then be the first ones to control the recreational by dominating the marketplace. And that is their, that's their business model. So by dominating the medical market, it appears to be a good play by Curaleaf for their desired U.S. dominance, creating big cannabis, reminiscent of big tobacco, and I would anticipate actually being worse because we're talking about a drug that affects the way people think. So the interest of Russian money in the U US, can in U.S. cannabis has not been just limited to curly. Here's a headline um, from October of this year, just two months ago from the New York Times. Uh, just a couple of months ago in October, as reported in the New York Times, Russian investors have flocked to the U.S. cannabis industry in recent years. They go on then to, to talk about more, but then there's also the other headlines, so that Russian money, cannabis, and Giuliani all in the same headlines. Um, and from talking points, there's another headline. The sleazy marijuana plot buried in the explosive indictment of Giuliani's associates. associates. This is talking about what just occurred in October of this year in Nevada. Um, why might this discussion of big players in cannabis be so important to Vermonters when making decisions about marijuana? I ask that question. Uh, we know that of the seven states in the Northeast region, this would include Vermont and what we usually call, refer to as New England, but also New York, we're a part of this Northeast region. Only two of the seven have decided through voter refer referendums to embrace commercial marijuana. That means 70% of the states in the Northeast and even a larger percentage nationwide have not jumped into the frying pan, into the flame. Currently, Vermont is in that majority of, majority of five of the seven who have not yet gone, and I would recommend that it's not a wise idea to do this. Based upon the experiences that we're seeing across the country, what we see in Massachusetts and in other states who have done this. Uh, Evidence-based science tells us that the majority of cannabis products are used by a minority of users. I suspect you've heard this before. It's the 80-20 rule. With 80%, the majority of the product consumed by just 20% of the users. Why is this? This is because of that, that word addiction. That is what the money is in creating addiction. And youth with their developing brains are the targets of mar marijuana promotion and normalization. They are the ones that will be targeted with, with addiction, with the money, with the 80% of youths. Uh, Russian money, cannabis, and Giuliani. And political influence schemes. I think we went backwards, but we're good here. Now, okay. Um, in the last, um, you may have heard in the case of Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman. Uh, this was in Nevada recently. The grand jury indicted in Nevada just two months ago. Uh, these individuals linked with two million dollars of Russian money to illegal camp to illegal, with illegal campaign contributions in exchange for marijuana licensing favors. Florida politicians are also linked to cannabis money with ongoing federal investigation. This has also been reported in the new news. And coincidentally, this Nevada thing just happened in October, but within a few weeks in Massachusetts, just a few weeks in November, as reported by the Boston News, U.S. Attorney Lelling in Boston began investigations into political influence and money and marijuana. Massachusetts is home to Curleaf, a vertically integrated national cannabis company that intends to grow, process, create these products, and sell them to our communities. Where do Vermont politicians stand when it comes to political influence, power, big money, 
Russian political influence and cannabis. Um, I want to, those of you who have watched this whole thing, thank you very much. This means so much to all of us. Personally, I can just tell you, when I've been on the bench looking down in the face of a widow whose husband and 16-year-old son were killed by a driver doing 100 miles an hour on the wrong side of the road, the woman looked up at me with tears streaming down her face and asked for my help. And of course, there was nothing I could do. There's something I'm doing now, which is with these people and others trying to prevent more and more such tragedies from happening. And I hope you'll tell your legislators not to permit this. The increased use of marijuana in, in this state will kill people. I want to thank you for your time and attention.